13 so Exodus chapter 13 and we so I'm just going to read from verse 17 Exodus 13 Exodus 1 3 verse 17 and it reads as follows when Pharaoh let the people go God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country or through the land of the Philistines though that was shorter for God said if they face war they might change their minds and return to Egypt so God led the people around the desert road towards the Red Sea the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle all right did you catch that uh, the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle but God saves them from taking a shortcut through the land of the Philistines because they might face war and in seeing war they might get scared and think about returning back to Egypt but when they left Egypt they were ready for war after leaving Sukkot that's verse 20 they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert by the day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people 14 1 then the Lord said to Moses tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pihahiroth between Migdol and the sea they are to, they are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Balzaphon Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion hemmed in by the desert and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord God so the Israelites did this may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word amen, amen. right so um, just on the topic of disappointment with God right one of the things that disappoint us especially in life um, and in our Christian walk one is if there's a feeling of entitlement right that because I'm a Christian and because I'm a child of God God must do good things for me right you have to be you, are, you feel entitled to that you, you, you feel like you know uh, I've even heard it in people when people pray uh, and they say you know pastor I have prayed I have fasted I have done everything that God uh, has asked me to do but I don't understand why is he not coming through for me or conversely some are not as bold as to say that they will say you know pastor I don't understand why God is not coming through for me as if to say I deserve for him to come through for me right because I have I have done all that he, he, he has required of me of course this is different uh, if you'll remember from our first session this is different from saying God promised to do one two three for me right uh, and therefore I claim his promises or I am this is completely different from that which we discussed uh, in our first session this is now where you get to an area and to a place of entitlement where you feel like because you're a Christian and because you I mean our grandmothers used to say this when they were when they were praying and you'd hear it in their prayers and they'll go oh Lord um, I don't know how to say this in English. I say, You know, don't port us, Lord. Uh, we are known by your name, right? We are known by your name. People know us to be believers. In other words, you've got that uh, sanctified version of Abantu Bazotini. Right? So, so, in other words, it's not that we want God to do this thing for us, it's not that we want this thing from God. And this is where I'm headed to. It's not that we want God to do this thing for us. It's not that we want God, we want this thing from God. It's just that we want God to save us from the humiliation of being, of being seen as people who don't believe, even though we are known to be a people of God, right? So we want God to prove himself uh, to other people. Show yourself, Lord. And we shout and we scream, show yourself. Be a consuming fire right trying to stroke God's ego when in fact it is our ego that is on the line and not God's ego right that, that, that that's 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 the that, that's the that's the point of this whole thing right um, and so here I know, this is what this text and this passage uh, seeks to address and what I want to use this text and the passage to address right and so number one it's not everything that you want that you are ready for you might be desperate for it you might need it right but you don't necessarily you're not necessarily ready for it including money see <laughs> right including money. maybe let me start there with the money because i heard that struck a chord and you know, said so we love our money shame you know it's like oh 
Lord, if you can just give me not enough, just more than enough, you know. So, I mean, money, money, yo, we love money. But, I mean, the fact that you love it and you need it does not mean you are ready for it. And I'll show you how. Um, I said this, and I used to say this when talking to people around stewardship. So we'll talk about how, you know, when you're in debt, right? And you'll say, Lord, give me money so I can pay my debts, right? Now, you need that money because the debts are uncomfortable. And let's be honest, though. Whose debts are they? Who created them? Right? I mean, I, I, we can make all justifications, but I know we were trying to compensate for a shortage. But really? Really? Hmm? Is that what the debts are about? Right? And so we'll go on and I'll talk to God and say, give us money so that we can pay off our debts and so forth. Now, I say that the, the most urgent thing at that point is not for you to get money to pay your debts. Right? The most urgent thing is for you to learn how to handle money. That's the most urgent thing. It's for you to learn how to handle money. And, and we don't like this one, right? I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't invite me again. But we don't like this one, so this is, this is a fact. The most urgent thing when you're in debt is not to get more money to pay those debts. It's to learn how to handle money. Because your debts are indicative, and I'm not talking about the essential debts, I'm talking about those debts, you know those debts. Do you know what the difference is between an essential debt and those debts? Is that the people for those debts are very quick to call you when you miss a payment, right? The essential debt people are always trying to find a way to help you pay. The other ones, they want their money now because they know that, yeah, of course, high interest rates and all of that, because they know also that, um, I mean, their lending to you is not secure, and what they've sold you is not, as, is not pertinent. But the other guys, like your house and your car, they know that they, will, they can get you to negotiate for that, because those things are essential to your life. But, I mean, Truett tells me, hey, we want our money, we're taking you to the lawyers. Ah, ah you know, at least I still have a house. <laughs> And I'm still going to wear the clothes. Nobody's going to stand. I mean, no guy from Truett is going to stand at the gate there and be like, that is our jacket. We want it back. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that, right? Uh, I mean, I know, but hey, car people. Car people, I could be preaching a hot sermon here and done, and there they are with their tow truck. They were looking for Mr. Bloss. They didn't even call you pastor. We are looking for Mr. Bloss. Because you know, when you applied for the car, you're not applying as a pastor. So you're looking, and they'll take their car. So anyways, I digress. So, so that's the difference. That's how you know. So then I'm talking about those other debts. So what you need is for God to teach you how to handle money, right? How to handle money. So you stop. Here's how you get into debt, right? Here's how you get into debt. I'll tell you because I know, right? And I'm brave enough to say it. Here's how you get into debt. You get into debt because you think you have money to pay the debt. That's it. At the heart of it, my grandmother is a pensioner. She doesn't have debts. She's 95. She's a pensioner. She doesn't have debts, right? She hasn't had debts for as long as I've been alive. I ask her, Coco, why don't you go and, you know, get a debt so I can get a pair of jeans? She says, Niko can I? In other words, what am I going to pay it with? So her fear of debt is not because she doesn't want me to have those clothes. It's that she does not think she has enough money to pay the debt. Conversely, what makes you brave enough to take the debt is the assumption that you will have enough to pay the debt. Right? And so you keep taking this little bit, 200 feet, and they say, ah, it's only a 400 rand installment. Ah, I can do that. I make 10,000. There's 250 here. Ah, I can pay that. I make 10,000. But you're not adding your 450 to the 250 and so forth, right? So you end up with debt. You end up avoiding your phone. You can't answer your phone, especially if it's a number you don't recognize, and you lie to us and you say, you know, I don't like numbers I can't recognize. So, oh, goodness stress, right? So, 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 so we know, we know, right? And, 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 and you, start in, you end up avoiding your phone, you don't touch your phone, and your kids know that around about end, month end, you're, you're short-tempered. You're short-tempered. You don't like noise. <laughs> You know when you are stressed, you can just silence, just absolute silence. Hey, anyways, I was about to. I'm gonna tell you this. So my son is eight. My wife is my son. My son is eight. My daughter is three. She turned three in May. 
right? So when my son was young, you know when as a parent you buy your kids all these kind of toys, all these types of toys because you want them to have everything. So I bought him the scooter, there's a scooter, the plastic scooter, the one, th yeah. yeah, the one that doesn't like tiles and hard surfaces, it just goes, and I saw this thing, I saw this boy enjoying this thing, and I thought to myself, Lord, grant me the strength and the serenity to endure this, right? And once this boy is grown, I'm going to throw this away, right? But I didn't wait for him to grow. Now I'm confessing in front of you. I didn't wait for him to grow. I threw this thing on the roof of our house, right? away from where he was, so that he just, he just, I'm better than my friend. My friend threw it in the garbage truck. It was a Wednesday. The garbage truck came. He saw this thing. He thought, ah, let me take it. And he threw it in the garbage truck and it left. So my son actually forgot about his scooter, got him a bicycle with rubber wheels, you know, decent, sophisticated toys. So he rode his bicycle. My daughter grows up. She's two. Do you know what my wife does? Yo. She goes and buys a scooter. This is last year. I'm not working. Do you think I want that noise around me? Right? Do I want that stress around me? And this thing is noisy and she just takes it at the wrong time. So this week, I found out that the garbage truck comes on Wednesdays. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> right. So sometimes you just want quiet, noise and quiet. I mean, silence, not noise. Silence when you are in trouble. But I'm, I'm, I'm belaboring this point in this illustration, right? Illustration is not supposed to be longer than your presentation. So what you need when you're in debt is the ability to handle money, not money, right? It is actually more merciful sometimes for God to allow you to go through the process of paying your debt at the stipulated period than him saving you and allowing you to pay it off quickly. Because there's a fine line between being merciful and being an enabler. Can I say that again? Right? There's a fine line between being merciful and being an enabler. Right? So the, your problem is that you just, you're not responsible. You can't handle money. Like, you can't. Right? You're not disciplined with it. So to give you more money is not to solve your problems. It's to enable you to create an even bigger problem than the one you have. You know this. Because you've prayed for more money to pay off your debts, but the debts are still there, but the money is gone. Uh? Yeah, the money arrived, you didn't pay the debt, you chowed it, and you said, no, I'll give them 10,000, and I'll keep the 15, just to close the other holes. And you didn't close any other holes. You chowed the 15, and you didn't even enjoy it. Because you kept eating it bit by bit. Uh? You kept eating it bit by bit, and before you know it, and this is the sad thing about money, you start with 15, and you're like, ah, it's 13, still manageable. Next thing you wake up, it's 8,000. And then you're like, hey, it's going. I'm like, okay, let me just buy this. And next thing, the eight is five. And at some point, the five becomes three and a half, and you're like, ah, you know what? That horse has bolted. <laughs> <laughs> let me just hammer it. See, my, 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 my philosophy is, my philosophy is, man, rather than waiting until you, are, you get 3.2, 3.5 before you... If you're going to chow it, decide at 15 that this one I'm eating and eat it as though you're eating the 3.5. You know why? Because when it's finished, you don't have the stress of not having enjoyed it and the stress of not having done what it was supposed to do. At least when it's gone, you've got the stress of not having done what it was supposed to do, but you enjoyed it. You've got the memories. Are you with me? It's not a strange gospel I'm teaching you. I'm, I promise you, it's not a strange gospel that I'm teaching you. And I've done it. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to chow this money. But let me buy something I'm going to love. I'm going to buy something I'm going to look at, I'm going to enjoy. And when the money is gone and that thing is there, I look at that thing and I don't feel like the money is gone. Even the problems that need that money suddenly become silent. Right? So, we don't need more money sometimes. We need discipline. And there's a period between the discipline and when God actually delivers you. Because God will deliver you from whatever you're going through. But the, if the deliverance comes before your preparedness, then the deliverance can become an even bigger curse than your current turmoil. All right? Like I said, if you have debts because you make debts from 10,000 rands and you're praying for a job for 35,000 rands, 
You're not going to pay off the 10,000 rand debts. You're going to create debts that are the equivalent of 35,000 rand. Because in your mind, you don't calculate, man. You don't, you, have, you don't have the capacity and the ability to, to calculate how to use and distribute your money, right? You don't have it. So before you get that 35,000 rand job, God must keep you at that 10,000 rand until you pay off that debt over 24 months. Sometimes until they call you. And, they, and they, don't, they don't stop blowing up your phone. You need to experience the pain of your ill discipline so that you'll never do it again. Wait. It's grace. Like, it's grace. Hey, let me tell you this story. It was 2015. 2015. We were playing Stockfell. Right. Playing Stockfell, 2015. And these guys, for some odd reason, decided that the Stockfell money must come to me. Right. 2015, the Stockfell money must come to me. It's a lot of money. More money than I've ever handled in my life. And I saw this money and I thought, man, I'll keep it. And I thought, the best way to keep it is to use it. <laughs> right. And then when the Stockfell comes around, then I, then I pay them. Right. So, I did that. Of course, you know, you start bid, I can replace it. 2,000, I can replace it. 5,000, I can replace it. But you're not counting the accumulation. You're right. I, I thought I can replace it. I can re Until at some point, I think I was on 40,000 rands that I'd used of the Stockfell money. Right? Ask me what I did with that money. I've got no idea. <laughs> but it was disappearing. Right? So then the months came. Right? So then I, I remember uh, it, was, it was right about August. I woke up. I'm like, hey, this money is going to be needed now in December, right? It's going to be needed in December, and these people want money. Yo, guys, I suffered from August, right, all the way to November, thinking about how am I going to return the money. Fortunately, uh, I got some, some money. Don't ask me how. I got some money, and I was able to pay that. But from August to November, the stress. Now, you know you pray. Say, Lord, I'm a pastor. <laughs> the humiliation. And the embarrassment from this, ah, God is like, twaga, twaga, in wele church. Twaga, smaggy. Nothing. For months, nothing. But you know what? You can give me money now. I will never touch it. Because every time someone, give, in fact, I even reject people's money. I don't, wanna, I don't want it in my hand. Because the stress of August to November, that stress, even it was 2015, to this day, I remember it. To this day, I still remember. I don't want you to give me money. So sometimes you need to go through the consequences of your ill discipline, right? And sometimes it's that experience that saves you from repeating the same mistake. Are you getting what I'm saying? So there's a shortcut for God to get you out of what you're going through. And I'm not just talking about money and debts. There's a way that God can, there's a shortcut that God can get you out of this thing. There is a shortcut, but you're not ready. And you know you're not ready. Right? You know it. You know you're not ready. Right? Ultimately, I mean, you know, with this, with this passage, God says, I'm not going to take them through the land of the Philistines, even though it's a shortcut, um, because they will find war there. Right? And then they'll want to turn back. Uh, but the, 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 some of the problems, sometimes the problem with the shortcuts that we ask God to give us and to grant us out of, as, or as a form of relief from whatever troubles we're facing, some of those shortcuts, the wars that we'll face will not be created by the enemies and the people who occupy those terrains. It, the war that we'll face is one that is internal. It is one that is caused by our own lack of discipline. Right? And so for me, it has always been a problem, right? To pray for deliverance from something caused by your own contribution to it without praying for God to eradicate the very thing and the very flaw in your character that leads you to that point every time. Hello? Right. So, when we talk about disappointment with God, it's, yes, let's blame God. Let's, let's, let's take God on, especially when he doesn't deliver on the things that he has promised, right? But also, let's take responsibility, right? Let's be accountable. Let's take some responsibility. And for me, that's when disappointment ceases to become a dark, depressing place, but it actually becomes a place of learning, a moment of learning and being teachable, right, through that disappointment. So, so, and I think I said this last time. I said, look, so you go through whatever you're going through, 
right? And you experience the pain and the discomfort of going through it, right? And you'll get out of it. But the question is, you're not a better person for having been through it. So it was a waste. Imagine suffering for nothing. Literally. Imagine suffering for nothing, right? So, like you suffered for nothing. You're not a better person for Hey. Do you get it? Right? And someone says, you know, Bloss, he doesn't have a job. But you know when he comes back, he's going to be a better man for it. That time, I'm not even learning anything from this whole thing. When I come back, I'm the same, same depraved, same ill-disciplined, same procrastinator I was even before. I haven't picked up any new hustling skills. I'm sorry to use the word hustler in church. But you know, you haven't picked up any new, any new temperaments, any new skills, any new dispositions, man, that, 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 that the security of having a job gave you, right? So, are you, so my question to you is, right, are you going to spend so much time, you know, mulling over the disappointment that you forego the opportunity to learn, to grow from this, this current experience? And someone says, you know, some of our suffering, shame, and I agree, there's some suffering that's just not necessary. Like, you, you can't learn anything from it. Like, I lose a child. There's nothing I can learn from that. Right? Or miscarriage. There's absolutely nothing we can learn from that. Like, I promise you, there's nothing. Lo miscarriage, I, do, I don't care. How, what you, uh, there's nothing you can learn from that. It's just an unnecessary, uh, you know, evil. It's just evil flexing. Right? Just evil flexing. But I know, you know, I'm here. There's absolutely nothing you can, you can learn from that. But it's not every trial and tribulation that is without lessons and that is without... That was not providing a moment, a teachable moment for you, right? Especially those trials that are that find root as a result of your contribution that you contributed to, right? Those things that 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 requires that requires that requires that requires that requires you to just stop maybe and reflect, and it needs to stop always being a. Uh, and I can say this because we've had two sessions where it was where disappointment with God was about talking to God about your disappointment. Now it's like let's sit with it, let's reflect on it, let's you know, let's deal with it and let's grow from it, right? Second point that 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 this thing. You know, whatever, this, you know, these disappointments and these trials, you know, being prolonged. I mean, we're standing outside with Lyndon. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but someone came and said, hey, you know, uh, we, we're greeting, greeting. How are things going? It's like, hey, it's hard. You know, it's like, ah, no, it's temporary. And this guy says, no, it's not. Sometimes it doesn't feel temporary. It feels like it's going to last forever. You know, it feels like it, it, this thing is going to last forever. It doesn't feel temporary. Look, like, troubles are like being underwater right it's underwater and holding your breath underwater and then uh you're almost out of breath and someone comes and places their hand over you we used to play this game it, don't try it at home it's a bad bad game in the pool right so you'd be swimming swimming and someone grabs your grabs you by the ankles i get you are lying flat on the water someone grabs you by the ankles right and just holds you yo imagine being black <laughs> in the pool and not having the use of your legs, right? Because, I mean, you know how it goes. It's kappa, hands and feet at the same time. That's how we swim, right? So someone has taken half your swimming equipment and you've only got your hands. So now, but you, you realize, hey, man, even my, my strokes are wrong. Like, I can't, even, I, can't even, I can't even use my hands properly. And then you go under the water and it, that thing felt forever. It felt like it was going on forever. Right, when someone just kept holding on to you, like, ah! you scream until your voice dies and you go under the water, you get up again, you go, and that's what being in trouble. But when you look at this thing, like, uh, you know, in the broader scheme of things and in the broader scheme of time, you realize that these guys probably held your feet for like 45 minutes, for no longer than a minute, right? But that minute feels like an eternity, right? And that's what troubles are like. That's what problems are like, right? And because, and here's, the, here's their power. Because trials have the capacity to incapacitate you, right? There's a part of you they incapacitate. There's a part of you they render useless. Like, you know how we held on to each other's legs, right? There's a part of us that is unable to move. Having to pedal with your hands alone, right, is tiring. And so, and so it feels like it's a long thing. But the problem is not the time. It's not the duration. The problem is what you don't have access to. Am I making sense? Right? It's what you don't have access to that is making this feel more unbearable. It makes it feel even harder uh, to endure. Right? 
Um, so so you, you want this thing to end immediately, suddenly. You want it to stop. You want it to stop like as soon as, as, as possible. Now, the, this is the third point. The problem again, and this is where this text is, 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 is going, is that where you want to go, the places you're praying to occupy are already occupied by turmoil. They have their own challenges, right? They have their own difficulties, right? Have you ever heard people say, hey, we have problems. Right? This one ends and this one starts. This one ends and this one starts. No, but what, 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 it's not a new problem. Some of the problems we have are a function of our progress. Can I say that again? Yeah. Right? Some of the problems we have are a function of our progress, right? The function of our progress. There was a time, man. Yo, there was a time. Oh, I must stop t touching this thing. There was a time when all I needed to do when I was, you know, about my accommodation, all I needed to worry about was electricity and rent. That's all I needed to worry about. Electricity and rent. That's it. If anything broke, we call the landlord, they come fix it, right? I didn't even know about levies and what do you call Hey, foot. I'm not going to start venting here. There was a time, there was a time when all I worried about was just rent and electricity. And we even got prepaid. I started renting, and I didn't even specify it must have a prepaid cut or prepaid electricity. We don't want this thing, this non stop thing from ESCOM. I want prepaid. I want to be in control of how much electricity I use. There was a time, my sister when that was all I worried about, right? And I said to God, you know what, God? You know what, the wisdom, black wisdom, rich dead, poor dead science, you can't be paying rent for someone's property. You need to go have your own property, right? That's what we wanted. I know I prayed as a man of God. And I said, Lord, your servant can't stay in people's homes and keep renting. Give me my own house. And God delivered Right? God delivered. I couldn't sleep last week. Right? Because now I need to buy electricity. I need to pay a bond. There's an insurance for this thing. Then there are levies for the estate. Then there are fees we pay to the municipality. Right? All I needed was just rent and electricity. Now I'm paying for electricity, levies, the bond. And you know before, if there was a default on the levies and the municipality brought the letter, I'll take it, take it to uh, the estate agents and they will send it off to the, to the landlord. Do you know if I default on my levies now, do you know who that letter comes to? Do you know whose name it carries? Do you know the stress of seeing your name on a demand, on a letter of demand, right? But... Right? That stress is a function of progress. It's a function of blessing. Right? I prayed, look, it cannot be a blessing anymore just because it comes with more costs. If you prayed for it and you got it, it's a blessing. The fact that you don't like the consequences and the responsibilities of it does not change it from being a blessing. Right? What you should have then prayed for is, Lord, give me the blessing, but also the capacity to fight the wars that come with the blessing. Because there ain't no blessing that comes cheap and devoid of wars. Even children, children, babies, I told you just now, even children, blessings. We, call, we have parties, we call people to come and celebrate this thing. We have gender revealed, we have what baby showers, we want to tell people, we can't stop talking about our children and all of that. They're a blessing, they're a blessing. But those same blessings are the little devils that run on with these plastic scooters and make a noise when stress is killing you. Those same devils are the same ones that you hide sweets from. I mean, yeah, you hide because they ask for everything you eat. Everything you eat. Everything. Those are the same devils that don't want to sleep, but then they cry because they can't sleep, but then they have the right to sleep, but they don't want to sleep. And then that same, same blessings, but full of war. And sometimes I say, man, you can pray for a baby or for a child. You can pray for God to give you a child, right? And the question is, are you also praying for the patience and wisdom needed to raise that child? Right? And sometimes I say this to men. I say, you can pray for a boy. You know, God, give me a son so that, you know, I don't know why men want sons, but God, give me a son 
so that you know. I was say, man, if you're praying for that son, are you also preparing to make room for him in your life? Because he's not going to raise himself. He needs you to be involved. He needs your presence. He needs your discipline to be able to say, there are things I'm not going to buy for myself and I'm going to buy for these children. When you pray for those children, are you also praying for God to diminish your selfishness? Because where you are going, that land you are praying for is full of Philistines and there's war. Am I making sense? And I used to say this when I used to live in Durban. Right? Linda will know this. And say this, you pray for a job, you're not working in Durban, pray for a job. You pray for a job. You sure you want a job? You sure you want to wake up at 4.30, catch a taxi, be told to sit four or five in a row that is supposed to sit three people, right? At 4.30 a.m., cold, you go to work, you get there, you've got colleagues who gossip as if it is a fashion, right? And you become the forder of their gossip. Is that what you want? You want a job, right? You know that when you want a job, you're also praying for a boss who's unreasonable, who's got mood swings, who might not like you just because I got puanga. Right? Is that what you want? You, I mean, so when you pray for a job, that's what you're asking for, right? That's what you're asking for. But the, the, the problem is, and this is where this thing is, when we pray for breakthroughs, right, we're not, we don't pray for God to keep us aware and to prepare us for the responsibilities that the breakthroughs come with, for the wars and the turmoil that the responsibilities come with. We're only praying for relief. That's it. We're just praying for God to give us use of our other limbs, right, so that we can be, we can be functional. But that comes with responsibility. And then I get it, friends. Then I get it. Why then? When Jesus sees this man who's been sick for 38 years, right, who's been sick for 38 years, I mean, the Bible says Jesus saw him and knew he'd been in that condition for 38 years. Like Jesus knew that this man was in that condition. That man would not be there unless he wanted to get well. But Jesus still asked the question, Sir, do you want to be made well? That's a question to reflect. right? Do you really want this thing? Right? Do you really want this thing? Are you sure you are ready to divorce yourself from being incapacitated and to assume the responsibility of being able to walk? And sure, sure enough, the, the first thing that happens to this man when he is able to walk, right, he has to enter into debates, things he has never had to do for 38 years. He has to justify his healing. Something he was saved from when he was lame, right? But when you, the moment you ask to, to be given the ability to walk, you must know you're going to be treated as a human. And humans, humans are evil towards other humans. So you want that job? Do you want that money? Do you want to be a man? Do you want to be money maker? Are you ready to only get calls from people who just call you to ask you for money? Are you ready for that? To have transactional relationships? Are you ready? Is that, is that what you want? Are you ready for it? Right? Someone says, ah, with money, me. <laughs> It's fine. Right? So, so and, and the point I'm trying to illustrate and what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there are delays. Right? Not all delays are necessarily out of spite. And not all delays are because God doesn't uh, trust you or God doesn't love you. And at times, the delay is actually an affirmation of God's love for you. Right? And so, during that delay, right, take time to reflect on your own need. So how prepared are you for that thing that you are praying for? Right? How prepared are you for that thing that you are praying for? Right? Are you ready for it? Or is it just vibes? <laughs> As the kids say, is it just vibes? You know, it's like, yeah, God. And then you get it and it's like, thank you, Lord. It's, I mean, I can make illustrations after illustrations. You remember when you're taking taxis? Do you remember? Just jump in pay, jump off. And you said, Lord, this thing of waking up early and my peers are overtaking me. They are going, I, give me a car. Then the thing came. Now you must pay insurance, must pay tires. You realize wipers run out. Now you understand why the taxi driver never replaced them. Right? <laughs> now you understand why the taxi was always so worn out. It's expensive, it's costly to run this thing, right? And this thing now, suddenly there are parts that must be bought and yeah, 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 it just comes. But those are a function of progress. Some of the stresses are a function of progress and the delay is to say, look, you're not ready for what comes with this, right? You're not ready for it, right? You're not ready. So let's take another way. 
There is a shortcut that goes through the land of the Philistines, right? There is a shortcut. There's a shorter way that God could have used to get the children of Israel to the promised land. But, but, they were not ready for the demands of the shortcut. And my question to you is, you're praying for this shortcut, you're praying for this relief, you're praying for this, uh, you know, deliverance, quick deliverance, right, microwave deliverance. My question is, are you ready for what comes with that? Right? Again, there's nothing more, I think, demoralizing. I may say demoralizing, I don't want to say depressing. But there's nothing more demoralizing than praying for something and then get it and then discover just how underwhelming it is. Right? So you get it and then you get it and then you, you're like, hey, this thing is not what I thought it would be. I didn't think working here would be like this. <laughs> But when everyone asks you, what's your dream company? It's the company you work at now. You get there and you realize, no, man, this thing was glittery from the outside. It's rotten inside, yeah. It's hard. Now you're telling people, you know, I don't want to sound ungrateful. <laughs> you know? But, you know, I just wish he could relocate me. And then, of course, we all try and find like more acceptable reasons, like just so that I can have time. You know, where I work, I don't have time to keep the Sabbath. You know, I, I just need time, more time to prepare for because it's just I don't want to travel too much. I want time to be with my kids. And the truth of the matter is, you are underwhelmed by what you thought was your breakthrough, and God saved you from it for a long time until He couldn't anymore, and He gave it to you. Now, hey, I don't know, guys. I don't know about you. But there are times in my life where I've been grateful that God has kept me suspended in the hope of getting something. Right? At least hope kept me alive. Right? Then allowing me to experience the disappointment of getting what I wanted and discovering that it's not what I thought it was. I don't know if that makes sense. I think there's a, there's, there's a possibility of recovery from hoping for something. That it, just hoping for it keeps you from falling into a ditch, a depressive ditch, right? But getting it and then realizing that it's not what you thought it was, you, that is, you know what it's like? <laughs> you know what it's like? It's like praying for 100,000. Have you ever 100,000 called? Have you ever 100,000? 100,000. Sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Guys, I've held 100,000. Not in my hands, in my account. <laughs> right? And, you know, I went in. I asked for 20,000 rands. I wasn't going to buy anything. I, was, I just wanted to touch it. Like just hug 20,000 rands just, and then give it back to them. Say, no, put it back inside. You know, just 100,000. Guys, I thought 100,000 was life-changing. Right? I, I thought 100,000 rands, life-changing amounts. Like these are, these are monies that our grandmothers dreamed about. These are sums that, you know, yo, 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 yo. Hey, I got 100,000 rand. Nice to pray for that. Like, God, give me like, like lots of money. Let me, like, I just want to, before I die, I just want to experience having lots of money. Just 100,000. And God gave me 100,000. I believe it was God. Right? Gave me 100,000. So, before getting it, I was living in the hope that it's coming. Die. I'm going to get this hundred. I'm going to get this money. I was hungry for it. I'm going to get this money. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. God is going to give it to me. And God gave me the hundred thousand. So I got it. Then I realized, hey, I've got things to pay. But you know how these things come? It's like five thousand here. What's five thousand when you're hundred? <laughs> then I think they told me like that my car, the starter in the engine was. Was, was needed fixing, it was 15,000 rands. And I said to them, I said to them, uh, 15? And they said, you know what I was saying, 15? I, I was shocked that it, was, it wasn't as expensive as I thought it would be. But look, in my normal life, 15,000 is expensive. But not when you have 100,000 in your account, right? So I said, 15? And then they said, no. <laughs> we can negotiate if you want. And I said, oh, they think I'm poor. <laughs> So I said, yeah, what's your best price? Look, I'm not even negotiating for a price. I'm just like, what's your best price? And he says, no, we can knock it down to about 12,000 if that's what you want. He said, 12,000? But yeah. Um, and then I hear the other guy say, no, give him 11 and a half. It's okay, 11 and a half. I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> I made a saving. See money, see what money does. 
gives you bravery <laughs> to stand up for yourself. <laughs> that money makes you brave to not accept things. That, so anyways, ah, guys, point is, I don't have that 100,000 anymore. It's gone. The day I finish the last 1.5, I remember. The last 1,500 rand, I remember. I remember the last 1,500 rand from that 100,000. The last bit, I remember it. My son came and asked me for Roblox. What? Robux. Robux. Yeah, for Roblox. He asked me for Robux. You know what Robux is? It's fake money in a game that you buy with real money. So now I've got 1.5 of 100,000, and he wants Robux. And I see these things. There's 800, which is 200 rands. You get 800 Robux for 200 rands. And I said, that's what I'm buying him. So that's it. 200, down to 1.3. 100,000 is gone. <laughs> Do you know the near depressive episode I went into, right? I'm, I'm using the word depression loosely here, right? But the state of sadness, right, that I went into is a sadness deeper than the sadness I experienced when I didn't have 100,000. Do you get it? At least then I lived in the hope that I'll get it. Now, what do I hope in? Now I'm thinking, this thing is gone. Where will I get the next one? And of course, I'm not going to get... This thing, can't, it doesn't last. It's not as big as I thought. The disappointment with what you thought would be life-changing is much more severe than the disappointment of God delaying what you thought would be life-changing. Am I making sense? And so sometimes it might look like a shortcut, but it is littered and filled with difficulties, challenges. And so God says, no, man, let's not go through the shortcut. Let's take the long way, right, through the wilderness. If I had time, I was going to tell you about the joys of being in the wilderness. Where, you know what happens in the wilderness? Do you know what happens in the wilderness? Right? If we took the shortcut, you have to fight a war. Then you get to that country. You have to build a house. You have to build a shelter. Suddenly you need resources to build that thing. You have to buy food. To, to have. You have to buy clothes. You know? when you, because now you have your own property, your own house. You're a man of your house. I get linded. You wanted to be a man of your house. Now you are. Now all of a sudden you have to pay fees. You have to buy clothes. Your clothes. You have to buy your kids' clothes. You have to buy cars. Because now you wanted independence. The independence you prayed for, it comes with wars and responsibilities. right? But you know what happens when that delays? You go through the wilderness. right? You get all of these without working for them. Because here's the thing, guys. Whatever God delays, God provides. You didn't get that. Right? So whatever God delays, God provides. So these guys go through the wilderness. Do you know what? They never have to buy food because God provides food in the morning and in the evening, in the wilderness. Right? These guys go through the wilderness and they never have to buy clothes because the ones they have never get old. Right? They look new. And the, one, the, feet, the shoes on their feet never get worn out. Right? But if they'd gone through the land of the Philistines, they would have to assume responsibility for the things that God is now providing for them for free. Right? And these guys never had to pay any, any plumbers for water. They had to pay any municipality for rates because the water came from a rock. How do you charge me for water that came from a rock? Can you explain how it came from a rock? So you can't charge me because you can't explain it, right? And God gave them water from a rock, right? They never had to pay for it. It was free of charge. Never had to install air cons or fans or heaters, right? Why? Because it became a pillar of cloud by day to keep them cool in the heat of the wilderness and a pillar of fire by night to keep them warm in the cold winter nights, right? In other words, God provides what he delayed. He provides the comforts of what he delayed. And so sometimes, right, I can find myself blessed in the wilderness, in paradise in the wilderness, right? But because the paradise is not what I had in mind, right? My disappointment with God is not informed by God's lack of ability or God's inability to provide for me where he has allowed me to be. It is informed by the picture that has 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 painted and the and the life that God has, has subjected me to that it doesn't correlate to what I had in mind it doesn't quite correlate so sometimes the disappointment is not that God is failing it is that I'm refusing to let go of this picture so that I can enjoy what God has made available I mean I, I also I, I say this right and I tell you this like just pause for a moment just 
That thing you want, that thing you think is life changing, that thing, that thing, that thing that, that you, you, you can't sleep without praying about, right? Just push it out of the window for a moment, just lock it outside for a moment, like, like that noisy scooter, just throw it on the roof, or put it in the garbage truck, you know? Like just let it give you peace, just, and then locate yourself, right? Locate yourself in the present reality of your life without this thing and see how blessed you are. It might not be paradise. It might not be the promised land. But man, the water is still flowing from that rock. Right? It might not be a property within the Santon precinct. But man, the clothes you're wearing, they're never getting old. Right? And the shoes are not getting worn out. Man, it might not be state-of-the-art aircon. You know these aircons that are remote controlled, by, not even remote, they are phone controlled. <laughs> hey, you see things out here. Music here on the phone. And then it plays in the house, in the bathroom. And the music is playing here. It might not be that, man. It might not be that. But man, the plumbing in the wilderness, the comfort in the wilderness, almost matches the things you're praying for. Chances are, right, what you're praying for has already been made avail available to you. Right? What you think is your breakthrough has already been available to you. It just doesn't look like what you think it should. It doesn't look like your design, right? It just doesn't match your design, but it's already been. And here's the beauty of it. You get to enjoy it as a gift from God and not something that you are responsible for maintaining. Can I say that again? The beauty of being in the wilderness? Oh, I don't know how to explain this, man. See, the, the, the discomfort of the wilderness is Last point, and I'm going to sit down. The discomfort of the wilderness is that it's not, it's not abundance. It's consistency. Right? That's the key of being in the wilderness. You don't live in abundance. You live in consistency. Okay. So, we wake up in the morning, there's manna. You have enough to eat for today. <laughs> You're not sure where tomorrow's bread is going to come from. Right? So when you sleep, the manna is gone. Right? You go sleep. But when you wake up, God is consistent and he delivers it. Right? And that's why we don't want the wilderness. Because there's no abundance in the wilderness. Right? But there's sufficiency in the wilderness. Right? You always get what you need. Exactly when you need it. Right? And, and, and once you've used it, it's gone. Do you know what that does? Do you know what that does? Right? It forces you to live in a relationship of trust. It forces you to trust. Because when you've got nothing to depend on, God becomes all you have, right? And so he's all you can trust, right? So when the manna is gone, where, where do you get the bread for tomorrow? Ech, man. I said this in another church, they almost stoned me, so don't stone me, right? So the reason why we pray for abundance is sometimes it's because we don't trust that the one we request the abundance from has the capacity to deliver enough every single day. So we say, no, deliver it once. Deliver it on Monday. I'll take care of the rest of the week. What what these kids say on, <laughs> on, uh, on social media? Uh, you know when someone says, give us this day our daily bread. And someone says, no, God, give us money. We'll buy the bread ourselves. <laughs> right? And sometimes that's what we want, right? We just want God to give us the money so that we can do the rest for ourselves. And like that time, God is like, no, look, I mean, I'll deliver the bread every single day. No, 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 just give me the week's bread on Monday. And the reason we want that is not because we want abundance. It's just that we want the security to know that should he not show up tomorrow, at least I'm fine. Right? Converse is also true. Living in sufficiency, right, forces you to not trust the abundance of what you have, but to trust the consistency and the faithfulness of the one who promised to deliver it every day. All right. and that's what we trust in, right? Because we sure as hell can't trust our ability to handle the blessings it's given us. We've squandered them before, and we're going to do it again unless he teaches us how to handle it. We can't trust him. We can't trust ourselves to fight the wars and the battles, and the to bear the responsibilities that come with what we're praying for. But we can trust him to navigate and help us navigate the way through. I mean, if he can wake, make a way through the wilderness, what can't he help us through, right? 
Here's the trick, right? Here's the trick. I've spent too much time on my illustrations and gotten to my point, so I don't know how I'm going to root this last point, but here goes, right? It is God who tells them where to camp. It is God who directs them. And then it is God who knows that that places them in a position of vulnerability as far as Pharaoh is concerned. Pharaoh is going to look at them and he'll think they are wandering and that he will think that they are lost. He'll think that they are trapped. And then I will wage my war on Pharaoh, right? I will, I will, I will, I will crush Pharaoh. I will overcome, right? And then, of course, 1414, you know, they see Pharaoh coming. The plan has already been laid in 1, 2, 14. They only see Pharaoh in verse 14 of chapter 14. And then God, say, and then God sends, sends Moses to the Israelites and they says, Hey, the, the Egyptians you see today, you will see them no more. The Lord will fight for you. You be still. Right? You be still. Right? Because the Lord will fight for you. Did you follow that story? When they left Egypt, they left in ranks as though ready for war. But God doesn't send them through this land of the Philistines because that's a land full of war. Instead, he sends them to the wilderness, right? And then places them at the risk of a war by the Egyptians. And then doesn't allow them to fight the war, but he fights the war for them. My comfort is that if God has allowed you to be here, then God must fight for you here. You be still. All right? If God has led you here, that's his plan. This is his map, right? Could have gone through the Philistines, but he chose for us to be here in the wilderness. That's the beauty of being in the wilderness, is that we don't fight. It is the Lord who fights for us. All right. So, learn what you can from this season of disappointment. Grow as much as you can from this season of waiting, right? Grow as much as you can from this season of waiting, right? Learn to trust as much as you can from this season of sufficiency. If you can't trust the abundance, trust God's faithfulness to deliver every single day, right? Just learn, learn that, learn that. And learn to be still during this season. Just learn some stillness, see? God can't fight when you're up and down. It's running here, he's chasing your enemies, he's chasing your problems. Now where you are here with your hand on the problems, <laughs> You ever tried cooking with a three-year-old? You're chopping, chopping, there's their hand, trying to grab the carrot while you're chopping the carrot. And you think, I'm going to chop you. And I'm not going to be sorry. Right? Because what's your hand doing there? Right? But, I mean, because they're trying to help you, but I don't need your help. I don't need you to do that. Right? So what I usually tell my kids is that I give them all the ingredients and I'll say, go sit on the sink, you wash them, and you hand them to me. Right? So they do the fairly innocuous activities so that they can be saved from the danger zone of where I'm preparing the meal for them. Yeah. Don't despise your years of innocuous activities. Right. Don't despise them. This period of waiting. It's just to get you out of the way so that God can do and deliver what he needs to do for you. Is that fine? Right. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. All right. let's, let's pray together. So, dearest Lord and Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for the delays. We want to thank you for the denials. We want to thank you for the seasons of waiting. We want to thank you for the opportunities of growth. We want to thank you for the moments to reflect, to confront our own shortcomings. Yes, we've prayed for jobs, but we haven't sought the education that will place us in a position to get those jobs. Yeah, we've prayed for breakthroughs, but we haven't resourced ourselves so that we can be in a position to be privileged when those breakthroughs are availed to us. We've prayed for money, but we haven't prayed for the discipline that is required in order for us to handle that money. And so at this time, we also want to thank you, as difficult as it is, for not delivering these blessings prematurely lest they become a curse. We want to thank you for saving us from the wars of the shortcuts. We want to thank you for being so patient with us, even though we've been so impatient with you. So today, as hard as it is to wait, as hard as it is to breathe, 
under this crushing weight of the problems and challenges we're facing, we choose to trust you. We choose to be still. And we pray, oh dear God, that you will honor our response to you with deliverance. You will honor it with sustenance. Most importantly, you'll honor it with your unwavering faithfulness in seeing us through. Dear God, we pray these things not because we are worthy, but we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.